Hey everyone, it's Erica Stapleton with the 12 News I team, and I want to let you know about some new reporting in our series Cost of Crisis. This time we took a deep dive into the zone, Phoenix's largest homeless encampment. Right now, there are more people sleeping on the streets than there are shelter beds available. And this camp, just blocks away from the state capitol, has not only seen more people, but more crimes and more fires. Not a day goes by. And you see how much it's gotten out of control. Without someone needing help in the zone, Phoenix's largest homeless encampment. Nobody wants this in their neighborhood. We were mid-interview with Bill Moreland in front of his business, Electric Supply Inc. at 9th Avenue Madison. Hi, 917 West Madison. When we had to stop so he could call 911. Uh, we have a gentleman trespassing in the parking lot. He seems to be having a fit or a seizure of some type and we've asked him to leave and I don't even know that he can hear us. He's in the middle of some kind of an episode. About five minutes later, he obviously needs help of some type. Police and fire crews pulled up. Thanks. And put the man in handcuffs after he dropped the rod he was holding. You doing all right? We were told he'd be taken for an emergency psychiatric evaluation. I have employees who have been down here for 40 some odd years and they never felt unsafe until the last two years or so. The biggest change, the growing number of people living in the encampment that surrounds his shop, and with that comes constant calls for first responders. The 12 News I team analyzed police 911 data around the zone, focusing in on these nine key blocks. Since 2019, through June of this year, police responded to more than 4,000 calls for help. Just five types of calls account for more than half of the police response. Trespassing, welfare checks, fights, assaults, and mental health transports. I've had an employee attacked and headbutted. I've had another employee have a knife pulled on him. The I-team learned that starting in 2022, police were also required to respond to all calls for the fire department too. As of early November, calls for service to the fire department have already eclipsed the three full years before it, with spikes in nearly all kinds of calls, including breathing problems, assaults, and heat-related illnesses. In one 24-hour span on one fall day, the I-team received tips on three different fires, two of which destroyed encampments. When you come home to nothing, and you already don't have nothing. Including Aisha's. Starting over is very rough. Aisha said she'd been living on the streets in the zone for about five months when an alleged cooking fire from a neighboring tent destroyed her belongings. We've been through so much, you know, it's a one bad thing after another. And I'm not perfect, but God, you know, I just need a break. Makeshift fires are a common sight in the zone. To barbecue or to stay warm, I'm, I'm one of them. My bones, they hurt really bad. But if they get out of control, Engine 3, Fire Channel 5 for a debris fire in the shelter, 230 South Fulton Avenue. My biggest concern is how many people get hurt. Personally, I'm not that worried that it's going to burn my building down. Uh, it's more going to hurt the people who are living in the tents. Bill is trying to be part of a solution, serving on the board of directors at Central Arizona Shelter Services, or CAS, the state's largest homeless shelter in the heart of the zone. What we need to do is we need to build a lot more shelters. CAS has plans to add more than 200 new specialized shelter spaces for seniors and those experiencing mental illnesses over the next two years. In October, the city of Phoenix also approved a new shelter space in Tiny Home Pilot. But our goal is to have it open by May of 2023. But it's still not enough right now to cover the more than 900 people on the streets in the zone and hundreds more unsheltered throughout the city. We're gonna end up paying for people to be out here on the street one way or another. I mean, we can pay for the fire department to come down and put out a tent fire, which is about the worst way to handle it, or we can pay to have the people have some place to go so that they're not setting their tents on fire. The need has never been greater for Aisha and her partner. We're actually waiting for housing. But for now, they're left in the ashes. The city supposedly, I guess they're gonna come and uh, clean up. Waiting for a chance to start from scratch yet again. One day at a time, right? Safety concerns aren't the only thing troubling those who live and work in the zone. The number of people sleeping in tents on the street in this area tripled this year. And the city of Phoenix is facing challenges when it comes to keeping things clean. Freddie Brown Jr. thought he knew what he was getting into. So we've been here since 74. With PBF Manufacturing, his family's longtime casket-making shop in downtown Phoenix, 
blocks away from the state capitol. My family owns the building, owns the property, owns the business. We are centrally located. But lately, what once was the perfect spot. So when we're talking about like a lot of the issues. Now comes with challenges. This stain right here on my sidewalk is urine. Over the past couple years, he's been experiencing unanticipated changes in the neighborhood brought on by the growing homeless encampment, which at its peak this year was home to more than a thousand people sleeping on the streets outside. I've had to clean piles of human feces. Urine is a constant problem. All of our doorways have been sealed or blocked. The conditions are brutal, not just for Freddie. It's pretty rough. But for those staying in the encampment. I think a lot of it just has to do with survival. I've seen a lot of stuff that shouldn't be done on public streets. It's horrible out here, the people are in horrible conditions. They gotta go poop and pee in buckets and there's no bathrooms. And uh, there's one bathroom for like 400, 500 people. Andrew said he'll only come here during the day for resources at the Human Services campus. He's been turned away due to lack of shelter beds and doesn't feel safe on the streets outside the campus. A lot of people get beat up and robbed and pressured for drugs. A while back, I did have an employee assaulted with a pipe. The environment hasn't cost him many customers as they mostly ship items out. But it has cost him job applicants, cleanup time, and security. What we're struggling with right now is we are trying to redo the outside of our building, make it a little more appealing, but I can't find a construction company willing to work down here because they're worried about theft, vandalism, having stuff go missing. From Freddie's view, the city is dropping the ball. And we understand that the city of Phoenix is doing things, but it's been over two years so that is why we've filed the lawsuit, because they continue to drag their feet. In August, Brown and more than a dozen other property owners in the area filed a lawsuit against the city, claiming the city isn't doing enough to address concerns in the encampment, asking the judge to declare conditions in the encampment a public nuisance that the city would have to abate. The lawsuit documented open drug use, vandalism, violence, and waste, both human and otherwise. It's probably fair to say that it's gotten worse. In court, city staff admitted there were problems, but the city still filed to dismiss the lawsuit, arguing residents can't tell the city what to do and that court wasn't the proper venue to find a solution. They're doing something. It's something that the plaintiffs don't like and don't like that it's not happening quickly enough. That doesn't mean that nothing's happening and that the city isn't taking efforts to abate what is no doubt a terrible condition downtown. The city doesn't directly provide services for homelessness and contracts most of the work out. The city's doing more than it ever has to address the issue of homelessness. Scott Hall, Phoenix's Homeless Services Director, says trash buildup is a huge safety concern. When it comes to cleaning, the city is out three times a week going curb to curb, shoveling and raking items by hand, security and a contracted bio-waste cleaning service following close behind. We don't uh, get into anybody's personal property outside of the curb line. These sweeps used to look different. Prior to this year, people living on the streets had to pack up and move their encampments before the cleanings, or else their belongings could be thrown out by the city's street transportation team, alongside Phoenix police. But after complaints that the city was trashing things like IDs and birth certificates, it scaled back. The complaints also drew the attention of the Department of Justice and the Phoenix Police Department, which opened an investigation last August into Phoenix Police to determine, in part, whether the agency unlawfully seized or disposed of belongings. As of the end of October this year, the DOJ was still interviewing police staff and observing trainings as part of the investigation. They basically pick up trash out of the streets. Like around my building, they don't sanitize or clean up feces. Uh, they'll maybe scrape some stuff up and that's it. Two hours later, you wouldn't know they were here. As soon as the city cleans up the streets, more garbage seems to pile up. The city says Public Works empties dumpsters daily and they've recently restored grates on storm drains to avoid buildup there. We're trying to do more and we're trying to do it better. Our ultimate goal is to get everybody off the street. A new judge took over the lawsuit in early November, and it's up to him to decide if the zone is in fact a public nuisance or if the case should be thrown out. I don't think it's fair that me or my employees have to clean this as the trash keeps piling up. And I don't think it's fair that the city of Phoenix's tax dollars are going for cleanups that are ineffective. The city is hoping to start enhanced cleanings again in December, but this time there will be storage options and a way to reclaim lost items. Meantime, the Human Services Campus is grappling with the highest demand they've ever seen.
When it rains. We have a tent that's not exactly waterproof. It pours. We're wet. For Jennifer Owens. I know what I used to complain about it wasn't perfect, like it wasn't the Taj Mahal we didn't live in before. I eagerly, gladly go back to the lowest of apartments just to get off the street. Not just embarrassed to be on the street, I'm just uncomfortable. I just don't, don't like it. She and her husband wound up in The Zone, Phoenix's largest homeless encampment at the end of September, after their living situation fell through. And even on two incomes, it's hard to find for affordable rent. They say they bought a cheap tent from someone on the streets and pitched it here at the corner of 12th Ave and Jefferson. That is not a home. It hasn't been easy. A cramped tent, a neighbor's generator humming at all hours. Plus, they have their dog with them. He likes to sleep with us, to shower with us. He for them, the main thing in between this setup and a shelter bed are the hundreds of others in line at the Human Services campus. What is it like to turn someone away? Uh, it's awful. It's hard on everyone who works here that we can't fully meet the need of every single person. Amy Schwabenlinder is the executive director at the Human Services Campus. So this is the inside of our, our mailroom, our post office. Which is home to the state's largest shelter and other resources for those experiencing homelessness, like mental and physical health care, even dental care and mail services. Yeah, just right here by the exit. Jennifer's gone on site several times to get help, including a new ID and birth certificate. They'll even help you get housing, they'll help you get furniture, they'll help you do everything. Stand in a lot of lines, there's a lot of you have to get used to that. The campus's welcome center is now open 24 hours a day to accommodate the rise in people experiencing homelessness. When we look at the number here served over the course of a year and it's 12,000 unduplicated people. And right now, the shelters on site are regularly at capacity housing about 900 people each night, while more people set up tents outside. 250, 300 last August to almost 900 this August. While we are sheltering more people also, the total then in our neighborhood is about 1,700 people every night, and that's the most ever. It's hard to go in there and get help, and make it past all the homeless people selling drugs out here. Andrew told us he'd been homeless for about four years, and getting into the shelter for even just one night in September made all the difference. It was safe inside but it was only for one night and that didn't really help me achieve my goal. I need a place to sleep every night and be safe. People are literally dying. They're dying more in the heat because it's hot outside. They've been unhoused and it's not healthy to not have a home. The fierce urgency of now for me and my team is that when we don't do what we can, it literally affects people's lives. The campus trying to keep up with the need turning day rooms to shelter space by night, mats stacked against the wall until people can sleep on them. But as the needs grow, so do costs. Inflation top of mind. We've started budgeting in 11% more. And spending is necessary, even for a nonprofit. We have to pay people to do these jobs. I think sometimes folks might think we can have more volunteers running these programs, and it's really not a lot of roles that people want to do for free. In 2021, the Human Services Campus reported $8.6 million in expenses, which is almost double expenditures reported two years ago, with the highest budgets being employees and security services. Some of their funding comes from private donations, while other sources include partner facility fees or government contracts, including the City of Phoenix. And since the pandemic, the Human Services Campus got a big boost from the city including more than $5 million in COVID relief funding. That money is going to run out, though. We're all facing a financial cliff. That COVID relief money from the American Rescue Plan Act can only be used through 2024. So the boost will eventually dry up. And additional funding like that isn't guaranteed. My mantra is worry doesn't actually solve anything. So it is more about planning and continually taking stock of where are we at, what do we have, what can we do next. For Jennifer and hundreds of others. It's good that the, this place is here. We need it. The one-stop shop at the Human Services Campus can't meet all their needs right now. It's daunting to know we sheltered 900 people last night and there's 860 people who slept outside because we don't have enough shelter capacity here or anywhere in Maricopa County. Do you think the city of Phoenix is doing enough right now to address homelessness? I think the city of Phoenix is doing a lot. I think everybody can do more. 
Despite the lack of shelter space, resources, and long-term funding, there have been success stories at the Human Services Campus. In 2021, campus data says their teams helped 400 people into housing, and one woman's journey inspired her to give back. Ever since she was a little girl, Dorenthea Grayson always had an escape. I'm 70. Her art. Been doing this for a long time. Pouring all she's got. I need to put on my gloves. Into each and every piece. An escape. <laughs> she's eager to share with others. Her pieces now hanging all over the Human Services campus. A collection of resources for those experiencing homelessness in the Valley. The campus in high demand. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye. With homelessness on the rise. Uh, it's awful. Amy Schwabenlender, the campus's executive director, says they've seen the number of people camping outside the campus triple this year. While we are sheltering more people also, the total then in our neighborhood is about 1,700 people every night, and that's the most ever. The surge of people greeted by Dorenthea's artwork that often imitates one of the darkest parts of her own life. That stuff traumatized me. Dorenthea said she lost her home in a fire, and when things didn't pan out with family, she was facing a reality she couldn't escape. I started crying. Homelessness. I said, did I do something wrong? In 2021, she wound up at CAS, the largest shelter on the Human Services campus. You roll up, there's tents all around the place, people cursing each other out, peeing in the streets, doing all kinds of ungodly things. For nearly a year, she said she lived in and out of the shelter. And like any other uncertainty she's faced, it's just adding to what I really have on it. She turned to the one constant thing that keeps her going. I just thought to myself, I've been here all this time. Her art. I gotta give back. Like this mask mural, or the contents of her bag one day. Everybody has a hot mess. All on display to encourage others to keep pressing on. So it's a community. And as of this summer, Dorenthia now paints from her new apartment. It's so beautiful. After right. services on campus helped her secure housing and furniture. Yeah. Unpacking the art supplies. Makes it smooth. Before unpacking her clothes. This time. You get the bubbles out. She's working on another piece to donate to the campus. I like a cartoon version in the way of James Brown. A thank you for giving her a fresh canvas in her own life. Look forward to that. In Phoenix. That's what I do. Erica Stapleton, 12 News. As of mid-November, the city was part of opening a new shelter in a Phoenix hotel, adding 117 rooms, with people in the zone being a priority to get a bed. The city also plans to add a new shelter next year in South Phoenix, along with a pilot for tiny homes. That's not set to open up until May 2023, and it still won't be enough to accommodate all of those who are unsheltered right now. In Phoenix, Erica Stapleton, 12 News.